Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Adam. Uh, I want to start by saying that uh, I'm going to be talking about a topic here, which I think um, hopefully should be of interest to you. I think there's something going on here. I think there are some interesting questions that haven't yet been explored. Um, but I'm very much coming to this as a relative outsider to the philosophy of history and philosophy of historiography. So like what uh, Yoni Monti said, um, uh, I focus uh, a lot on uh, epistemology, especially knowledge. So my work is largely in um, how we make judgments about uh, what other people know, and then more broadly, how we make judgments about other people's mental states. Uh, so this is the kind of thing that I'm going to be talking about today. And specifically, I'm going to be raising a lot of questions that I think are not sufficiently addressed about how we make judgments about the mental states of past agents. Um, I think this actually fits really nicely with a lot of the content of the previous talk. Although, again, I'm coming at this from a perspective of what an empirical researcher. So you guys, you, you got to let me know uh, the extent to which you think that this might match with your research interests. We'll see. All right. So I'm going to start out with some really basic uh, facts about how we think about other minds. Uh, so uh, the general capacity that I'm going to be talking about here is called theory of mind. And this is just broadly the cognitive capacity to represent the mental states of others, to track them, to um, to reason about them, to understand what's going on inside the minds of others. Uh, this is called a lot of different things. People call it mentalizing or mind reading or folk psychology. And these all generally approximately refer to the same thing here. Uh, and this is just this ability to represent the mental states of other people. Uh, I'm gonna be using the term mental state attribution pretty frequently. And by this, I just mean uh, a mental state attribution, just judging that someone occupies some mental state. So a knowledge attribution is just a judgment that someone has a knowledge state. A belief attribution is just a judgment that someone occupies a belief state uh, and so forth. Uh, so what kind of mental states are we talking about here? Um, uh, broadly, we can uh, we can make a distinction between two main classes. Uh, so the, the kind that I focus on primarily in my research are representational states. So these are mental states that represent the world as being in some way. So we're talking about uh, thoughts and beliefs, uh, as well as um, uh, confidence states, or um, what are often called credence states, uh, and then especially knowledge states. So uh, these are uh, these are mental states that have to do with the way that the world is in some way. Uh, it's increasingly common to make a distinction between two kinds of theory of mind that applies to our representations of the world. Uh, the first is called affective theory of mind, uh, and this is a mode of theory of mind on which uh, the the operating assumption is that the mind of the other person. Uh, who we're thinking about is matching the state of reality that we ourselves have access to. So uh, this rules out things like um, uh, belief states, because belief states can or cannot match the state of reality. A belief can be true or false. Uh, mainly what we're talking about with fact of theory of mind uh, are knowledge attributions. So this is thinking about what other people know. Uh, knowledge states uh, necessarily uh, match the state of reality. So when we're engaged in this uh, factive theory of mind, what we're doing uh, is we're essentially assessing what people know. Um, this is a distinct mode of theory of mind from what's often called non-factive theory of mind. So this is a kind of mentalizing on which we're thinking about people's minds, but we're thinking about them in the way that their representations of the world may or may not match the state of reality. So these would be uh, uh, beliefs and credence states uh, are the best example of this. Uh, a belief can be true, but a belief can also be false. Uh, a credence state or a confidence state, uh, can we can be very confident that something's going to happen, uh, but that thing may not happen. We can be very confident in something that's false. Um, the, the, the crucial distinction here to make is that these, uh, these employ different kinds of cognitive processes, uh, the uh, fact of theory of mind and non fact of theory of mind. Um, it's debated the extent to which they differ, but these are just different modes about thinking about the minds of others. Uh, this distinction is going to be important in a minute. 
Um, in addition to these representational states, uh, we can, of course, also think about non-representational states, uh, people's desires and their hopes and their fears and, and so forth. Uh, um, this is not as much my area of expertise, uh, but again, it's, um, uh, it's just a really fundamental way that we can think about the, the mental states. All right. Uh, so I want to talk a bit. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about the roles of theory of mind in general, uh, and then I'm going to talk specifically about uh, how these roles um, might be realized when we're thinking about past minds specifically. Um, so uh, first, uh, theory of mind plays a very uh, basic fundamental role in explaining and predicting the actions of other people. So there's a causal relationship between our mental states and our actions and behavior, our hopes and our thoughts and our fear, fears, our knowledge. They, it all causes to act in certain ways. Uh, so one of the really basic roles of theory of mind is just explaining and predicting what other people do. Uh, for example, uh, I brought uh, an umbrella to Olu because I believed that it was going to rain. Uh, that belief may be true, that may be false. So far, it doesn't look like it's rain, but what explains my action in that case, my umbrella bringing behavior, is that mental state that I have. This is just a, a basic sort of fundamental way that we use theory of mind. Uh, but this isn't the only way. Um, another way that we use theory of mind uh, is to facilitate normative judgments about the actions of the behaviors of others. So um, do you guys know who, who this is? Elizabeth Holmes? Right. So uh, Elizabeth Holmes uh, was the founder of a biotech company called Theranos. Uh, at its peak was valued at close to $10 billion. Uh, it turned out to be just a, a complete scam, a, a total fraud. The technology fundamentally didn't work. Uh, the tests that they were doing were uh, run on um, modified versions of commercially available machines. Uh, anyway, uh, but one of the most uh, crucial elements to our normative evaluations of Elizabeth Holmes, uh, the extent to which we hold her blameworthy uh, for the the fraud at the company is uh, the mental states that we attribute to her. Uh, specifically, whether or not we thought that Elizabeth Holmes believed that the technology was good, whether or not she believed that it was on the right track, that she was hopeful, that she was optimistic that it was going to get there, or if we thought that she didn't believe in the technology, that she was just cynically uh, she was just cynically, cynically operating a, a scam that got out of hand. Um, the whatever mental states we attribute to her are crucial and really the, the fundamental thing that determines the kinds of normative judgments that we make about her, whether it was just sort of like gross negligence on the part of someone who was overly optimistic or whether it was um, the, uh, the cynical operations of, uh, of a fraudster. Uh, additionally, um, another really important role that theory of mind plays that's getting uh, increasing attention is that uh, theory of mind uh, facilitates our learning about the world from other people. So, uh, for example, uh, let's say that you want to know how to file a patent. Uh, one way that you can gain that knowledge, that you can learn from someone else, is to uh, think about different agents uh, and judge which of those agents knows how to file a patent. So in this case, uh, it's almost certainly going to be a lawyer. You're going to attribute that knowledge that you're looking for uh, to a lawyer, and then you can go to that lawyer and, and, and gain that information. What you're doing is you're using that knowledge attribution to flag the lawyer, in this case, uh, as a reliable source of information. Uh, this is uh, primarily, um, I think, probably almost exclusively done through fact of theory of mind. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, belief states can be true or false. It's not sufficient to just look for someone who believes that uh, they know how to file a patent or who has beliefs about a patent in general. Uh, you have to uh, you have to identify someone who knows how to file um, a patent. Um, uh, this is sometimes referred to as attribution from a position of egocentric ignorance. Uh, all that this means is that uh, you're attributing knowledge to someone that you yourself don't have. So you don't know how to file a patent. And I can say the lawyer knows how to file a patent. So I'm going to go to the lawyer and uh, use the lawyer to get that uh, information. Right. Uh, so let's uh, talk a bit about theory of mind and uh, understanding history. So uh, I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to present a couple of conjectures here, at least from an empirical perspective, I think uh, they're straight up conjectures. I think some of them are more conjectury uh, than others. 
Uh, but first, I think that it's likely that theory of mind, and specifically these the cognitive processes that underlie theory of mind, play a key role in shaping our understanding of the past. Uh, I'm going to look at a couple examples here in a second. Um, but I think just uh, generally, I, I think that it's likely that uh, to it, to at least a significant extent, when we think about uh, past minds, we're employing these theory of mind processes. Um, however, I also think it's likely that we engage in theory of mind processes uh, differently in thinking about past minds versus thinking about present minds. And, and this is what's really intriguing to me is that, well, it might be the same uh, basic cognitive processes that underlie uh, that underlie our judgments about the mental states of past minds. I think that there might be uh, there might be distinctions to be made. There might be quite significant distinctions, in fact, uh, between how we think about past minds versus how we think about present minds. Um, uh, one of these is that I think it's particularly likely that theory of mind processes are uh, susceptible to error when thinking about the past in ways that um, we don't encounter as much in thinking about present minds. So it's, it's not necessarily that they can go wrong in different ways. It's just that they run into the limitations of our theory of mind systems more quickly and to a larger extent when we think about past minds as opposed to uh, present minds. Um, now, from what I can tell, uh, these kinds of questions have been inadequately explored. Uh, if you are familiar uh, with cases where someone is, is really dug into this, uh, you, you got to let me know. Um, one example, and I, I think maybe the, the, the biggest example of this is Rosenberg's How History Gets Things Wrong, um, which is a detailed, um, uh, it, it does take a detailed look at theory of mind within the context of history and uh, what historians do. Um, the problem, or at least one major limitation of this uh, of this work uh, is that Rosenberg is an eliminative materialist. So Rosenberg uh, thinks that theory of mind is just wildly inaccurate and doesn't give us a clear picture of, uh, of mental architecture. It doesn't really capture what actually explains the actions of others. And so this is, uh, Rosenberg's entire account is, um, is premised on the idea that theory of mind is just, is, is just wildly wrong. Uh, this is a radical view. Um, not a ton of people, especially like out, outside that, that like research program, agree with this. Um, and uh, and so um, it's not it's it's not clear that this is like the 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 fairest uh, the, the fairest approach when thinking about uh, the relationship between theory of mind and thinking about past minds. Um, However, outside of this, uh, this limitivist account, I'm not really aware of anything that engages with these uh, questions in any uh, sustained way. So um, my, my proposal here is that uh, maybe we can do that. Um, right, so let's look at a couple examples just to illustrate um, what I have in mind. Uh, the first example, and so we're just gonna take a look at um, really familiar, obvious examples in which uh, it, it, what, what looks like is going on is that a uh, mental state attribution as playing a significant, like the operative role in our understanding of the history. So uh, uh, first, uh, the explanation of um, why the South, why the American South seceded uh, at the beginning of, of the American Civil War. Um, this explanation, uh, the, the, well, these are just a couple of quotes uh, here from McPherson. And the idea is that the fear state of Southerners is what explains uh, the the action of the group, specifically uh, the fear uh, that um, uh, the fear that uh, Lincoln was going to um, Lincoln and the Republican Party at the time was going to uh, abolish slavery. Um, so this is a this is a really simple case in which this this fear state uh, explains uh, the actions of a group. Uh, what I want to point out here that's really interesting about it uh, is that this is a uh, this is a mental state attribution to a group agent. So we're not attributing a mental state to any one particular person. We're attributing it to a group. Um, I think that there's possibly a concern that in focusing too much on theory of mind and thinking about past minds, we're focusing too much on individual actors in history and not not focusing and um, giving them like an undue uh, role, um, but uh, I just want to use this example to point out uh, not only that is it clear that you know that, uh, historians frequently think about uh, the mental states of others and uh, use it in this like basic explanatory way, the same way that we use uh, theory of mind uh, in everyday context, but uh, this isn't just 
uh, limited to individual agents, uh, there's also uh, group agents. Uh, right, let's look at uh, another example uh, from Nixon uh, and his knowledge about Watergate. So uh, this is a really uh, this is a really um, interesting example because uh, this isn't a case so much in explaining Nixon's behavior as informing informing our uh, normative evaluation of his behavior. Oh, so this is a case in which uh, Nixon's mental states, particularly Nixon's knowledge states, play the operative role in our evaluation and our blameworthiness uh, um, judgments about uh, Nixon. So. Uh, so crucially, uh, it seems that Nixon didn't know beforehand about the break-ins, uh, that uh, he didn't have that knowledge uh, prior to that. Uh, but more importantly, he did know about the cover-up. Uh, he, he knew about the cover-up uh, from the beginning. Uh, the reason that, uh, that, that we hold Nixon uh, blameworthy in this case is specifically because of these mental states. So again, our, our understanding of the entire Watergate Saga is um, uh, is largely um, uh, our understanding of the whole Watergate saga derives in large part from uh, these particular mental states uh, that we attribute to Nixon. Um, right. So um, there we go. Uh, so I want to move on now to talking about this third role of theory of mind, which is learning about the world from other people. Um, so it, so I think it's easy to find examples where we use theory of mind uh, to explain the behaviors of past agents. It's easy to find uh, examples in which we use a uh, theory of mind to uh, inform normative judgments about past agents. Uh, I think it's less likely that uh, we use a uh, theory of mind to learn from past agents. Uh, I could be wrong on this. If you think this is incorrect, you, you, got, you got to let me know. Um, so I, I think this arguably under, underlies a lot of our learning about the past from historians, uh, but I think uh, it's less clear for past agents uh, that uh, we engage in this sort of fact of mentalizing uh, for that. Again, uh, you, you got to push back on this if you think this is incorrect, but I think that there's the fascinating possibility here uh, that there's an inversion of the ordinary precedence between uh, factive and non-factive theory of mind for present versus past minds. So in ordinary contexts, uh, arguably factive theory of mind is the default. So when we're thinking about the minds of others, especially the representational states, uh, it seems likely that we start out operating under the assumption that their perspective on the world matches our perspective on the world. It is much more cognitively demanding to engage in non-factive theory of mind. So in the absence of any reason to think otherwise, we, we tend to assume that uh, what they see is what we see uh, and that there isn't a mismatch between uh, their representations and, and the state of reality. Uh, however, um, I think when it comes to thinking about past minds, it is, it's at least possible, this is this is pure speculation, but I think it's at least possible here that uh, non-factive is the default, um, or at least that uh, there isn't this clear precedence of factive theory of mind over non-factive theory of mind. Uh, this is something that, uh, again, it would require empirical research to establish, but this is this kind of question uh, that, that I'm thinking about. Um, Right. So I want to talk a bit now about limitations on theory of mind capacities, um, because I think that it's likely that these limitations hold um, especially strongly when it comes to thinking about past minds. Uh, so um, first, uh, the management of self-perspective information is one of the key limitations uh, that are imposed on our theory of mind capacities. And so um, so by this, uh, to understand this, it's just important to keep in mind that there is often a mismatch between self and other perspectives. So uh, imagine that this is just a, a trivial case in which we have a figure standing here with a weasel under the table. Uh, this figure cannot see the weasel. Uh, we had five minutes, oh my God. So, um, uh, <laughs> right, okay, the, the point here is that there's a mismatch. It's, uh, this, it's cognitively demanding. Uh, to hold their representation and our representation uh, simultaneously uh, when it's uh, uh, when there's that mismatch there. Uh, this is the reason why young children and non-human primates can't engage in non-factive theory of mind. 
so yeah, we, we, ha we have to be able to uh, manage uh, competing perspective information. Um, uh, right, uh, another limitation uh, uh, comes from our ability to um, imagine the episodes in which we think about past agents. Uh, so um, so the, the important thing to keep in mind here is just that we don't think about uh, agents past or otherwise uh, as uh, like, we don't think about them in isolation. We think about them as embedded in some sort of context in, in particular episodes, uh, which uh, can include things like lo the location of the agent, the objects around the agent, the other agents uh, around the agent. Um, and the more vividly we're able to imagine that entire scene, that entire episode, uh, the more access uh, that we're going to have to the agents that we're thinking about. Um, so, uh, so for example, here, if we think about this agent just in isolation, um, there's a whole number of different mental states that we might think. If we think, what is this person thinking? What is this person feeling? We, we can speculate a lot about that. Uh, but if we pull out and look at a full scene, we can think it, it becomes much clearer or the possibility that that's a hunger state uh, that's on his face uh, becomes much more salient when we consider the entire agent in context leading on the shovel looking at um, a cartoon hamburger and such. Uh, right, uh, if we contrast that uh, with this guy, um, it's it's really difficult just in isolation to think about what this uh, this dude, this literal dude is thinking. Uh, but if we if we pull out and look at the the context, it's that that really doesn't help. No, so the, the point here is just that this is a really unfamiliar scenario with unfamiliar agents, with unfamiliar biologies in, in an unfamiliar world. Their mental states are completely opaque to us because we're not able, uh, because we have a complete lack of familiarity. We can't imagine what's going on. This is completely unfamiliar. This is an extreme example, of course, these, these weird taco cowboys. But uh, the, the point I'm just making here is that the further away uh, um, or, or the more remote or the more um, unfamiliar uh, episodes become, the more difficult it is for us to uh, to think about the mental states of agents within those. Um, so just to summarize here, because I'm running out of time, um, uh, just the, there, just uh, generally speaking, there's a considerable mismatch in the information available to past and uh, present agents. Uh, so uh, a past agent is going to have a much more narrow, fine-grained, contemporaneous uh, set of information available to them. Uh, present agents have broad, coarse-grained historical information, uh, and this is just a recipe for disaster when it comes to egocentric bias. Um, it's uh, probably not the case that it's like you know crazy explicit or anything like that, but um, th this this really does raise the possibility that a lot of times thinking about past minds, especially um, as a pattern. Uh, that there, uh, there could be a lot of just subtle biases towards uh, the self perspective. Um, and again, uh, it's increasingly difficult to imagine past episodes the, way, the more they're removed from present context, the more unfamiliar uh, the objects, locations, the agents, the beliefs, the social practices are, uh, the more difficult it is to imagine those episodes and therefore to uh, assess the mental states of agents within those episodes. Um, so I'll say that I don't, in this case, I don't think it's likely uh, that um, that this contributes to uh, incorrect representations of mental states. I think what, what's more likely here is that this just contributes uh, to a uh, a reduced use of theory of mind, just uh, to fewer mental state attributions, a, a sort of dampening effect, where uh, the more opaque mental states become. Uh, the just the, the less we engage in, in theory of mind. That's again, that's conjecture, but that that seems um, to fit with at least the way that. Um, I believe we're running out of time. Uh, so one minute. So uh, I'm going to skip this example. I was going to talk about an example from um, from the recent history of epistemology, which may have been confusing because it was about mental states uh, themselves. Uh, but anyway, so just, just to sum up here, uh, what I'm suggesting uh, is that I, I think there needs to be some sort of systematic study of mental state attributions for past minds. I, I think this is something that um, needs to include first just like cognitive science for um, studying this from a, from a behavioral perspective, from an experimental perspective, but also digital humanities to understand exactly how it is that historians use mental state attributions 
in writing, uh, as well as philosophy of historiography to understand the, um, the philosophical uh, implications uh, or uh, potential limitations of thinking about uh, past minds. Uh, possible questions, I've kind of already talked about this, but uh, this concludes, is there an inverted default mode for past versus present minds? Uh, do uh, past minds uh, default to non-factive theory of mind or present minds, uh, or we're thinking about present minds uh, default to factive theory of mind? Is there a, some sort of subtle egocentric biasing? <clears throat> uh, uh, and is there a possible dampening effect on attributing mental states uh, to more distant past minds or, or more removed from familiar context, as well as uh, philosophical consequences, uh, which um, I, I, I I think that you guys are more expert on that than I am. Uh, right, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Nine minutes uh, to go. Thank you for, for the paper. Um, I maybe start with a with a remark on on this last uh, third and last point that you were talking about uh, your hypothesis that the if we look into the past it becomes more difficult to attribute mm -hmm. state. I mean, isn't that? I, I I see why you're saying that, but isn't that, in a sense, a way of overlooking other ways in which state mind states attribution can become extremely difficult in the present too i mean a temporal distance between me and an agent mm -hmm. is just one dimension but there there are there are many other ways in which attribution of mind states in the present mm -hmm. without looking into the past might become extremely difficult like geographical distance cultural distance linguistic difference social differences and and so on so it seems to me that we shouldn't assume too quickly that the past is the real, like whether it's in the past or in the present, it's the real crucial factor. Yeah, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. So it's probably a bit of a misnomer that the contrast that I draw here is between past and present, um, because when I'm talking about present, I'm specifically talking about like the ordinary context, like, you know, so everyday, like, yeah, like, yeah, like everyday theory of mind. So like the uh, the applications that like theory of mind that, that we employ theory of mind in the most and that like you know these capacities emerged uh in order to like you know interact sort of face to face in familiar contexts um so so that, that's that's more of the contrast that i'm drawing here so the real contrast here is between a face to face interaction and uh, an attribution of mind states that is mediated by document sources. Yeah, I mean, perhaps perhaps not quite that, but it's it's more like ordinary familiar versus like you know uh, unfamiliar, um, and so I th I think that you know the, so the idea here is that of course there's uh, going to be a correlation between uh, uh, going further into the past and uh, becoming less familiar. That's the uh, that's the thought. Okay, thank you. Um, we have many questions. Let's be brief. The computer has one. Yes, we we, we oh. to get it in. Just one question from Josepina Doro from the University of Kiel in UK. From, okay. Uh, of most of us, you from nowhere. She asks, I quote, how can we understand others, whether present or past agent, at all on this causal theory of mind, since we cannot crack people's skulls open, and even if we did, we would never find the belief that, for example, it will be raining in Ulm. Okay, so okay, so there's a, there's a couple of things there. So um, the first is that there's that there is a bit of like an eliminat eliminativist like intuition there. The idea that if we if we crack the skull open, we won't find like a, a single neuron or like a, like a neural cluster that uh, that corresponds with the, the particular uh, belief. Um, that that's correct, uh, but it, I, I think it, it doesn't mean that the, the belief states aren't real, right? Like, you know, the um they the belief states don't have to exist like at, at the neural level in order to exist at the, the cognitive level. Um but um yeah. Um at the time uh, the question was um how can we understand others at all if we can't crack open the skull? So oh, right the uh, theory. Uh, how, 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 can, how can we understand others? Well, I mean, so that's a that's a really tricky question. We rely on lots and lots of, of different things and different cues for making inferences about other people's mental states. Um, and so the, the point that I would just highlight is 
that that we do like we do it quite frequently and we're usually quite good at it um it's certainly not infallible uh but we're generally pretty good at making inferences about the mental states of, of others yeah hey, uh, two quick suggestions um i've always taken the sort of classical mm -hmm. uh philosophy of history or just before like hollywood to me just reads really nicely the theory of mind yeah so that looks like a way to go the cognitive people called cognitive archaeologists have thought a lot about attributing different cognitive states a lot more than historians have. So maybe go check them out. Um, the thing I wanted to ask though was um, this learning from thing. It struck me just like a huge amount of stuff to unpack there. And in each way you might unpack it, I think we do it sometimes in the past, right? Okay. So one way people think about the learning from thing when they're thinking about folk psychology is sometimes when you're teaching me, I have to interpret you as teaching me. Right. Okay. So it makes sense of why you're saying things the way you are because you're in a teaching mode. That wasn't what you were talking about. Right. right. Well, maybe we'll talk about it. Another is what you were talking about was taking the reasonable source of testimony, mm -hmm. more or less. Yeah. You sometimes we do this um, very carefully in places like Roman history and places like medieval Norse epics. Right. Under the right conditions, with a lot of care, you take them as being you know sources of testimony. Mm -hmm. But what I'm really interested in is to be a source of testimony, you have to work out um what they know and historians and archaeologists do that all the time you're often trying to work out what do these people know what do they know about the night sky what kind of knowledge did they have you know if we're trying to understand their buildings and so trying to work out what their factor stakes are is a really big part of history it seems to me um, but then the taking them as a reasonable source of testimony seems like it's a bit of... right yeah so i think that it was I, I really, yeah, no, but I, but you're, you're totally right. Cause I realized maybe a little too late that like the distinction here really isn't between back of theory of mind in general. It's a specific, like, you know, Edward Craig, uh, use of it, like identifying as a, as a reliable informant. Um, and so I, so that, that is like the, the, the narrow sense of fact of theory of mind, or it's this particular use of fact of theory of mind, I think, which the conjecture is there's likely an asymmetry between thinking about the present and past, yeah. Jonas? Oh, great, thanks, yes, yeah, uh, very interesting. Uh, my question uh, is, um, would, uh, would you think that um, an explanation of action by historical agents without uh, mental state attribution mm -hmm. is always incomplete? Would I think that it's always, uh, incomplete for example the uh, the the we think about the the slave owning south mm -hmm. and i would investigate what kinds of interests did the slave owning south have mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, uh, in relation uh, in relation to uh, lincoln's plans uh, or lincoln's plans of abolishing slavery serves for them uh, uh, a reason to quit mm -hmm. the union yeah but so uh, is this an incomplete explanation of why they are quitting the union if i don't say also that well uh, we also need to mental state attribute them with fear for example of abolishing the yeah that, uh, so of uh, abolishing the of abolishing slavery yeah so, I, so, I, but yeah. the question is is action explanation without mental state attribution in, always incomplete? i mean in, in I, I don't know if always incomplete but like in the specific case that you're describing i think that it certainly strikes me as incomplete i hope i'm not saying anything too controversial but like it certainly strikes me as incomplete just to like state the state of affairs without um specifying the the mental state with respect to that state of affairs. yeah but why if they if it's in their interests to not do they they need so like a further interest to act upon their interest is that what you're saying or yeah well um what I'm saying is that for the reason to act upon what they got as a good reason. Correct. Right. Well, them counting it as a good reason is like a, that's well, if, they, like if they have a certain interest, then yeah, no, I mean yeah. describing that they have an interest, yeah, does, that strikes me as incomplete because it, it seems quite frequently that people don't act in their own interest. So I I I, I don't know. It, anyway, but I, I I feel like I'm not qualified enough to talk about that in detail, but um, I will say it does strike me as an angle. All right. Great. Yeah, thanks. Five minutes for moving and trying to see.